countdown, we have Nanny Doss. Nanny Doss, otherwise known as Nancy Hazel, was a seemingly innocent and sweet woman. But what people didn't know was that she took the lives of almost a dozen people between 1920 to 1954. She targeted people all across the South and Midwest, including her own family members. She apparently poisoned four of her husbands, her two sisters, her grandson, her mother-in-law, and her mother. She may have also poisoned her daughters. All were killed for different reasons. Some for money, some to avoid caring for them, etc. What's creepy is that she was nicknamed the Giggling Grandma. Why? Well, because every time she would tell the story of how she killed her late husbands, she laughed hysterically. In our ninth spot, we have Maximilien Robespierre. Maximilien Robespierre was a French lawyer who eventually became one of the most influential figures of the French Revolution. At first, he started out as a strong and great leader, until he became obsessed with the guillotine. He started encouraging more and more people to become executed. More than 17,000 enemies of the revolution were killed as a result, or anyone suspected to be an enemy. So basically, innocent people were killed. That's not all. In a span of 10 months, he took the lives of over 40,000 people, which is absolutely insane. That's like killing 4,000 people a month. Another point is that he lived by the motto, killing is better than forgiving, which is something a psychopath would say. Moving on to number eight, we have Henri Desiree Landru. Henri was a French serial killer who took the lives of at least seven women between 1915 to 1919. He did so by placing ads in newspapers pretending to be a well wealthy widower who was interested in meeting a new bride. A lot of women who had lost their husbands in World War I responded to this ad thinking that it was meant to be, like how easy, and he's got money. Sadly, they would be lured to his home, robbed, and then killed. After doing so, they were dismembered and burned in the oven. Very gruesome, I know. He was finally caught when the sister of one of his victims tracked him down and convinced police that he was the one who killed her sister, and she was right. He was convicted in November of 1921 and sentenced to death by the guillotine. Moving on to number seven, we have Harold Shipman, AKA Dr. Death. He was given this name because he was a doctor that killed at least 218 of his patients. So he was practicing in London from 1972 to 1998. During this time, he would kill innocent patients. In fact, he is said to be one of the most prolific serial killers in modern history. Like imagine going to a hospital thinking that they're going to save you and instead they kill you. He wasn't caught until people were like, wow, a lot of elderly women die when you're on duty. What's up with that? And then they noticed that his name was on a number of cremation certificates. So they got suspicious of him and he was later caught and convicted in 2000. In our sixth spot today, we have Jane Topman. Here we have another medical professional who was also a serial killer. Jane Topman was a medical nurse fascinated with death. To others, she seemed like a dedicated, hardworking and loving nurse, but in reality, she conducted a number of experiments on her patients. For example, she would give them a bunch of different drugs just to see what they would do to them. She also had the tendency to push her patients right to the edge of death and then bring them back to life and then heal them again. And then she developed this unhealthy obsession with autopsies. Jane was arrested in 1901 and admitted to taking the lives of 31 individuals, although the number could be much higher. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with Vera Renzi. She was a Romanian serial serial killer given the name The Black Widow. This was due to the fact that she killed her two husbands as well as her multiple lovers. It's believed that she poisoned and killed at least 35 individuals, including her own son. And that's because her son was onto her and one day found coffins in the wine cellar and was like, I'm gonna call the police on you, mom. So she poisoned him to keep him from doing so. Later, the police grew suspicious of her because of the disappearance of one of her lovers. They investigated her home and found 32 unburied zinc-lined coffins, each containing a male corpse. She was then arrested and confessed to everything. In our fourth spot today, we have Emperor Caligula. Now, this dude was the third emperor during the Roman Empire, and he literally was insane. Like, the stuff he did is just the definition of disturbing. Like, I don't think they can teach you about what he did in history class, it's that bad. So this guy was known to do messed up things to his prisoners, like he would grill them alive or chew on their no-go parts. 
He also just liked killing people for fun, or watching people get tortured. In particular, he enjoyed watching innocent people get killed and eaten by wild animals. He was so crazy, people thought like he had some sort of ailment, and that's what was causing him to do these things and be so messed up. In our third spot, we have Vlad the Impaler. Now, this dude was known as the real-life Dracula. In fact, the character Dracula was loosely based off of him. Like, in order for you to have a monster created off of you, you have to be a monster yourself. So this guy would do dark things like dip his bread in the blood of his enemies and then enjoy it. That's where the legend of Dracula sucking blood came from, because he would suck the blood out from his soggy bread. But he is most famously known for impaling his victims, hence why he's called Vlad the Impaler. This guy would impale people to death, just shove them on the stick so that it would come out their mouth, and then just leave them there. It's said that between 1448 to 1462, he killed about 20% of the population, which is a lot. Moving on to number two, we have Shiru Ishii. Now, the things that this man got away with are disgusting. He's literally the definition of mad scientist. So in 1936, this dude built a huge compound to perform a number of disturbing experiments in. This place was called Unit 732. Some experiments included getting women pregnant by his fellow scientists and then cutting open these women to study them while pregnant. He was also known to amputate limbs and then reattach them to other parts of the victim's bodies, or he would freeze body parts so that he could study what would happen if you didn't treat gangrene. Trust me, it gets worse. Other prisoners were his test subjects for grenades and flamethrowers. Everything he did was horrific, and he was sadistic. He loved torturing people and running disturbing experiments on them. And in our number one spot today, we have Pol Pot. Pol Pot was the Prime Minister of Cambodia from 1976 to 1979. During his reign, he cleansed a fourth of his own nation. He wanted to destroy the civilization and turn it into a new age. So he ordered a genocide against his whole country. As a result, millions of Cambodians were displaced, tortured, and killed. Others were forced to work in a field fertilized by human bodies. And if you stopped working, you would either be punished by not being fed or by death. And if you made a mistake while working, you were also killed. Many people literally worked themselves to death. I could do a whole top 10 list on the dark things that this man has done. Like it's that much, you know? He literally killed up to 3 million Cambodians. That's literally 25 to 33% of his country. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Rose West. Rose West is an English serial killer who committed her crimes alongside her husband. He definitely also would make a spot on this list, but he he decided to take his own life in 1995 after being arrested while awaiting trial. The terrible pair were investigated and subsequently arrested for taking nine lives together, with Rose receiving an additional charge for another tenth life. During the court proceedings, against the advice of her counsel, Rose decided that she would testify herself, and what a trip that was. During her testimony, she sometimes was very tearful and dramatic, but of course, an act like that can be hard to keep up, so other times she was cracking jokes and laughing. Imagine doing your tight five while you're on trial for the worst of the worst crimes. Luckily, it seems as though the jury hated that as much as I do because they came back with a unanimous verdict of guilty on all 10 crimes. Get this though, in prison, Rose West met Myra Hindley, which if you don't know who that is, she committed a bunch of very similar crimes with her husband as well, and the two became besties and even had an affair. But throughout this whole thing, Rose is still trying to say that she was totally innocent and that Fred was completely responsible for all of the crimes. So so wild. In our number 9 spot today we have Dennis BTK Raider. The BTK killer whose real name is Dennis Raider was one of the worst serial killers from 1974 to 1991. He left taunting letters for police and newspapers where he described his crimes, but thankfully this annoyingly large and misplaced ego is what led to his demise. After a 10 year hiatus from his disgusting crimes, he couldn't keep his mouth shut so he began communicating with the media again in 2004. This communication combined with his lack of knowledge on how technology works led to his arrest in 2005. During his trial, he didn't apologize for his crimes, but he did describe them in full detail, which is horrifying and extremely eerie. I could not even imagine having to be there during that. After his trial, he ended up being sentenced to 10 consecutive life sentences with a minimum of 175 years. When Raider was first arrested, when the police were taking him to the station, an officer asked him, Mr. Raider, do you know why you're going downtown? To which he replied, oh, 
I have suspicions why. In our number 8 spot today we have Randy Kraft. Also known as the scorecard killer, Randy is a monster who took the lives of at least 16 young men between 1972 and 1983. The scorecard nickname comes from how, after his arrest, police found a coded list that contained cryptic references to his crimes and the victims. On May 14, 1983, two California Highway Patrol officers observed a car driving erratically and suspected that the driver may be impaired, so they pulled it over. Once the car pulled over, Randy Kraft got out and identified himself and subsequently failed all field sobriety tests. At the same time, the other officer went over to the passenger side where he sadly found Randy's final victim, 25 year old Marine Terry Lee Gambrel. The next two days of investigation revealed the horrors of what Kraft had done, and on May 16, 1983, he was formally charged with the one crime, but many more charges came in the next months. His trial first began on September 26, 1988, and and on August 11th, 1989, the jury rendered a verdict of death and the sentence was upheld. As of this year, he still remains on death row at San Quentin State Prison, where he continues to deny any responsibility for the crimes. Like they didn't find one of his victims in the passenger seat of his car. I think the gimmick might be up, Randy. In our number 7 spot today, we have the Sleepy Hollow Killer. Starting in 1997, there were a series of killings in an area of South Africa that are all believed to be linked to one unidentified suspect who is being called the Sleepy Hollow Killer. During this time, it was believed that 13 crimes could be attributed to this person, and despite investigations, whoever the perpetrator was, authorities were unable to identify them. There was a small hiatus from the crimes, which is sometimes referred to as a cooling off period, but in 2007, they unfortunately began again. While the more recent crimes varied slightly from the originals, authorities believe it is the same person active yet again. There has only been one public suspect in this case, but unfortunately it is no longer believed that he had anything to do with these crimes and that the one he committed was entirely separate. It really is horrifying to think of people who do things like this being able to get away with it for a number of years, so let's just hope that they are caught very soon. The good news is that a special task team has been formed in order to really look into these crimes and explore and examine all of the circumstances, modus operandi, and all of the material evidence. In our number 6 spot today we have Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka. This is a double whammy because unfortunately both of these people are still alive, but the good news is that at least one of them, Paul, is still in jail. This horrible pair are often referred to as the Ken and Barbie killers, and while Paul started off living a life of crime, he quickly brought Carla into it as well after their meeting. That is not to say she is not just as guilty as him, however, because they are both fully responsible for their own actions. While Paul was arrested for a multitude of crimes, the pair were arrested and convicted of taking the lives of three separate separate people, one of them being Carla's sister. See what I meant about them both being responsible for their own actions? The investigation into the crimes proved to be quite difficult with authorities having plenty of hoops to jump through, and this is why a plea deal was created for Carla. She had one week to accept or decline the deal, which would give her a sentence of 12 years for her full cooperation. She accepted. Both were convicted in 2005 and Paul was up to apply for parole in 2018 and in October of that year he was denied parole. His next parole hearing was recently on June 22nd of this year and it only took an hour of deliberation to decide to turn down that application as well. I think 30 seconds probably would have been enough to decide but I'm just glad the outcome was the same. Carla on the other hand served her 12 year sentence and then was released, like years ago. She moved away from Canada and headed to Costa Rica for a while with her new husband and children, if you can believe that. But unfortunately, she has since moved back. In our number 5 spot today, we have Edmund Kemper. Edmund Kemper is an American serial killer who was convicted for taking the lives of 10 people, including his paternal grandparents, as well as his own mother. Wikipedia told me that he is noted for his height, as he is 6 foot 9 inches, and for his intelligence, as he apparently has an IQ of 145, but I personally think that he is most notable for being an absolute monster. His first crime took place when he was just 15 years old, and that was when he took the lives of his grandparents. After this crime, he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and spent time in a hospital before it was determined he was rehabilitated and he was released at the age of 21. After his release, he unfortunately went on a spree where he would target young females who were hitchhiking. After his final crimes, he ended up confessing and turning himself in, which is something we really don't see all of the time. When asked in an interview why he confessed, he said, the original purpose was gone. It wasn't serving any physical or real or emotional purpose. 
It was just a pure waste of time. Three court appointed psychiatrists examined and observed him and found him to be legally sane and thus he was able to stand trial. On November 8th, 1973, the jury deliberated for just five hours before returning a verdict of guilty. He has been eligible for parole since 1979 and has been denied every single time he applied, one time saying, society is not ready in any shape or form for me. I can't fault them for that. He is eligible to apply for parole again next in 2024. In our number 4 spot today we have the Long Island Serial Killer. Also known as the Craigslist Ripper, the LISK is an unidentified suspect who is believed to have taken the lives of somewhere between 10 to 16 people over the last 20 years. The victims so far that are known have been sex workers who use Craigslist to advertise their work. After the disappearance of Shannon Gilbert, police were searching an area along the Ocean Parkway and that is when they began to discover the remains of the victims. The first four were found in December of 2010, with another six being found in March and April of 2011. As of December 2015, the FBI is now officially involved in the investigation. There has been a suspect in the case, but any formal charges have not been laid in terms of these crimes. The most recent evidence in regards to these cases was a belt found at the scene of the crime, which may potentially belong to the killer. At the same time, it was announced that new scientific evidence was being used in the investigation, but these announcements came just last year, so we have yet to receive any further updates. Hopefully the case is solved quickly so that the families of the victims can receive justice and this terrible person is off the streets for good. In our number 3 spot today we have Robert Picton. This horrible person is one of the worst Canadians to ever live and is one of our country's worst serial killers ever. Picton dropped out of school and began working at his family's pig farm and this is where most of his absolutely horrific crimes took place. He was first arrested in 2002 and was convicted in 2007 of taking the lives of six people, but throughout an extremely lengthy investigation, evidence of many more killings came to light. Unfortunately, in 2010, the Crown stayed the rest of the charges, but I suppose at least he was convicted of the six he was initially charged with. During his time in jail, an undercover police officer posed as his cellmate and Picton confessed to 49 crimes to him. Apparently, he was saying to the undercover officer that he wanted to take one more life to make it an even 50 and that he only got caught because he was sloppy. Which is super ironic considering you're confessing your crimes to an undercover officer. The entire trial was a bit of a mess but it led to a life sentence without the possibility of parole for 25 years which was the longest possible sentence under Canadian law at that time. This unfortunately does mean that he will be eligible for parole within the next decade so here's hoping that that never ever happens. In our number 2 spot today we have Peter Tobin. Peter Tobin is a serial killer who was convicted for three separate crimes, but it is believed his crimes may actually be up in the range of 40 to 50. Before being convicted of these crimes, Peter also served another 10 year prison sentence for other crimes committed, and he was released from prison for those crimes in 2004. Three years later, however, he was sentenced to life with a minimum of 21 years for taking the life of Angelica Kluke in 2006. After this, remains of two more people who went missing in 1991 were found in his former home, and he was also tried for these crimes, which ended up solidifying his sentence to a whole life order, which means he will never be up for parole. There are some who believe Tobin is responsible for more unsolved crimes, and he has been labeled a psychopath by a senior psychologist. Apparently, while in prison, he has boasted about taking the lives of 48 people, despite the fact that he's only officially been linked to three. Hopefully, if this is true, the connections are discovered soon so that the families and loved ones of those victims can receive the justice that they deserve. In our number one spot today, we have Gary Ridgway. This horrible human being is also sometimes known as the Green River Killer, and his crimes took place somewhere between 1982 to potentially as recent as 2001. He was convicted for 49 crimes, but confessed to an unbelievable 71, which makes him the second most prolific serial killer in the United States in terms of confirmed killings. Most of his victims were either sex workers or women in other vulnerable circumstances, and through DNA profiling evidence, in 2001, authorities were able to connect him to four of his crimes. From there, they made a deal with him where they would spare him the death sentence in exchange for the disclosure of the location of all of the missing women. Gary took the deal and was spared a death sentence and instead was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Not only did he say that he chose the type of victims he did because they were easy to pick up and that he hated most of them, but he also called his crimes his career. So, 
he sucks. Coming in at number 10. Look, for those of us in the acting industry, we know it's a tough cookie to crack. Getting an agent is great, but then getting seen by the right people and then finally getting cast, it's a it's a heartbreaking and addictive biz. But until today, I didn't know just how deadly it could be. In the 1920s, the death of William Desmond Taylor, a silent filmmaker, was found dead in his LA bungalow with a gunshot wound in his back. Unfortunately though, it would be years before the killer would eventually confess on their deathbed. The death of Taylor crushed a lot of dreams and a lot of careers, including the teen star Mary Miles Minter, who according to police, had left a nightgown and love letter in his apartment. But years later, Mincher wrote an autobiography admitting that her and her mother were both at Taylor's home that night, but still no hint of confession until Mincher's mother suffered a heart attack and one of the sins she confessed to on her deathbed was shooting William Desmond Taylor for making a pass at her daughter. Sounds like a crazy stage mom to me. In our number nine spot today, we have Elizabeth Wetlaufer. This messed up confession comes from a woman who is named Elizabeth. She was a nurse in Canada who was working at a long-term care home for elderly people. You know, some of the most vulnerable people out there aside from children. Well, this woman, who was supposed to have been dedicating her life to helping and caring for these people, instead just decided to do the exact opposite. Between 2007 and 2014, she confessed to killing eight of her patients, and she also confessed to attempting to take the lives of four more. On October 5th, 2016, she sat down with Detective Constable Nathan Hergott of the Woodstock Police, where she was recorded giving her two and a half hour confession, and man, She's just talking like she's describing what she had for lunch and not what terrible things she did for years. Um, I took something from you that was precious and it was taken too soon. Um, I honestly believed at the time that God wanted me to do it, but I know now that's not true. Elizabeth is Canada's most prolific female serial killer, which is truly a title no one should aspire to hold. Coming in at number eight, this next one, Jeffrey Dahmer, you know who he is. Jeffrey Dahmer was responsible for one of the most gruesome criminal events in history, inspiring multiple creepy characters in horror films like Silence of the Lambs. Here is just one of the confessions he made during his jailhouse interview. I had uh, these obsessive uh, desires and, and uh, thoughts wanting to control them, possess them permanently. And that's why you killed them. Right. Right. Not because I was angry with them, not because I hated them, but because I wanted to keep them with me. And it just gets creepier and creepier from there. What creeps me out the most about this confession is his calm, cool demeanor describing it. Like he looks like someone you know, he looks like someone you could even get along with. He was self-aware enough to know what he was doing was wrong, but couldn't help himself. Also, how easy it was for him to turn a human being into an object in his mind. According to Dahmer, his desires began as daydreams and no one had any clue when things got worse because Dahmer was just a guy who worked at a chocolate factory. Coming in at number six, the fact that this guy relates the crimes he did to fulfilling a lifelong dream is just one of the chilling confessions of Bernard Giles. He was arrested in 1974 after claiming the lives of five women by the age of 21 in Titusville, Florida. According to Giles, he had a very pleasant upbringing and unlike many serial killers, had a kind and normal life. But Bernard says that only he knew he had a dark desire as he got older. At the time of the attacks, he was also married and the father of a young daughter, though he says he doesn't put his family and his victims in the same category. He didn't want to know his victims' names simply because he saw them as objects and nothing more. In the interview with Morgan, he also goes on to say that three women saved their own lives because they started talking to him. By doing that, they became real and because of that, he resisted the temptation. This was the same reason he didn't kill his wife, simply because he knew her. Bernard was just like everyone else, an electrician with a wife and a family. No one knew the monster that lied beneath until it was just too late. In our number five spot today, we have Dennis Rader. The BTK killer whose real name is Dennis Rader was one of the worst serial killers from 1974 to 1991. He left taunting letters for police and newspapers where he described his crimes. 
Well, this turned out to be his demise because after an over 10 year hiatus, his huge ego couldn't handle shutting up, so he began communicating with the media again in 2004. This subsequently helped the investigation and led to his arrest in 2005. At his trial, he decided to describe his crimes in detail, but made absolutely no apology for it. Not like an apology would help, but he certainly displayed quite a level of psychopathic behavior. There I realized that, uh, you know, I was already, I didn't have a mask on or anything, they already could ID me, and uh, uh, made, a, made a decision to go ahead and, and uh, shut him down, I guess, or strangle him. He ended up being sentenced to 10 consecutive life sentences with a minimum of 175 years, but no sentencing could ever truly be long enough. He remains at the El Dorado Correctional Facility where he will most likely stay for the rest of his life. Coming in at number four, what's the worst part about this interview is that it's actually being used as a sound clip on TikTok, which I think is awful personally. Whenever I come across someone using this app, I'm always like, dude, you know where that's from, right? Like, you know. So, um, if you don't, here it is. You, you murdered this man. Yes. You tortured him. Of course. There is no ambiguity and there is nothing you want to, s yeah, in court today you said uh, you're not here to pretend to be remorseful. Of course not, why would I do that? Angela Simpson was responsible for the tragic death of 46-year-old Terry Neely in 2009. This is just part of her interview, and you can see the reason for why it has made it on this list. What Angela did to Neely was severe and inhuman, yet she shows absolutely no remorse when it comes to recounting her reasons. Thankfully, she is now facing life in prison, though apparently that's not the worst thing for her. According to Simpson, she has a lot of family in prison, so it's not the worst thing to be able to see them. The fact that someone could do what she did and not feel an ounce of regret is what makes this video a chilling addition to our top 10. In our number three spot today, we have Kevin Davis. You guys, this truly is one of the most disturbing things I have ever heard in my entire life. Kevin Davis was 18 years old when he took the life of his own mother. It seems as though there was some sort of conversation beforehand that had made him upset, which is of course never a good enough reason to do something like this. There are details about this crime I wish that I could unlearn. In an interview with police, he gives them an extremely detailed account of basically everything that happened and seems to show absolutely no remorse. There's one thing he did that I truly cannot repeat, but you have to hear the way he describes it. Yeah, I kicked out of the bed, then I just, uh, that was kind of silly, but then yeah, I just decided to reach in and kind of just... Imagine committing a heinous crime and then going on to describe it as kind of silly. I truly have no words. During his trial, a doctor did testify to say that he had a personality disorder, but that he also fully knew the difference between right and wrong and knew that his crime was wrong and that there was no medical diagnosis that could justify his actions. Kevin is still in jail where he will most likely spend the rest of his life, but he will become eligible for parole in 2044. Coming in at number two, we're gonna talk about Edmund Kemper. Man, honestly, this whole interview, this whole dang interview, like how can one person be so evil and so helpful at the same time? If anyone has seen Mindhunter, that show led me to watch these interviews, and man, absolutely mind boggling. Ed Kemper is still alive and in prison today, serving time for the many vicious crimes he committed, taking the lives of 10 people before he eventually turned himself in, in 1973. It scares me to think whether someone even would have caught him. Part of the reason we had to include at least one of these interviews and confessions is because because as Mindhunter fans already know, he played a crucial role in building the criminal profiling unit with the FBI. His self-awareness and desire to relate his experiences made him the FBI's go-to guy when they had questions in the behavioral science unit. Kemper also excelled as far as an inmate could with an IQ over 145. Edmund Kemper still fascinates the public to this day and begs the question, can you ever really trust a serial killer? In our number one spot today, we have Daniel Wozniak. In 2010, Daniel Patrick Wozniak had his wedding and honeymoon coming up that were of course going to cost a lot of money. Instead of getting a second job or simply just doing, I don't know, literally anything else in the entire world, he decided to do the unthinkable. He ended up taking the life of his neighbor, Samuel Hare, and his friend, Juri Kabushi, so that he could steal money from them. It is absolutely insane that this is the story behind the crime, but I cannot make this stuff up. 
He ended up confessing his crimes to police, and while it is nice to see someone try to show a sliver of remorse, his self-pity truly is just too much, which makes me believe that his remorse has much more to do with the remorse of being caught instead of actually committing the crime. Daniel ended up being apprehended by U.S. Marshals at his bachelor party two days before his wedding. The trial was very long, but in 2016, he was found guilty and ended up being sentenced to death. He remains at San Quentin State Prison. <laughs>